everybody. Welcome back to the show. Uh, I know many of you are probably already familiar with the band The Hellbilly Thomists. They are uh, a bluegrass group made up entirely of Dominican friars, and uh, I've been aware of them for a couple of years, but only really started to check them out uh, with the release of their new album, uh, Living for the Other Side. I'll pull that up here. Um, and uh, it just happens that one of the uh, members, the percussionist specifically, is a priest at my parish here in New York City. Uh, and uh, so I'm going to be talking to him about uh, being a Dominican and uh, bluegrass and all that good stuff. Father Joseph Hagen, welcome. Thank you, Thomas. Good to be here with you. So, Father Joseph, I have to tell you uh, that you have been a huge blessing uh, at the parish. Um, first and foremost, I had been praying for a while that the priests at St. Vincent would preach more about Mary, and then mm. you showed up, and you're the most Marian <laughs> preacher of them all, um, and I always think we need more of that, um, and, and so I was very, very happy about that alone. And then in the past year, um, during those difficult months of mm. uh, not being able to go to Mass, it was a huge consolation to be able to go to confession every week. I mean, uh, they weren't officially scheduled, but you were you were the guy on point for confessions every single day mm-hmm. to to mm-hmm. to make appointments with, and that was a tremendous consolation to me. Mm-hmm. And also just seeing you, you know, preach on the live stream and uh, along mm-hmm. with the other uh, priests um, was a really wonderful thing. So I'm very grateful um, for for your service at the parish and also. Yeah. Um, also, uh, I'm going to give you something next time I see you in person in gratitude. <laughs> thank uh, you, thank <laughs> I thank just you don't have it yet. <laughs> I, I don't have it yet, but it, it has meant a lot to me. And, uh, we, we got you right fresh from ordination, correct? Yes. Yes. I was ordained May 25th, 2019. And I got here June 28th, that same summer. Uh, the feast, that was a solemnity of the Holy, of uh, the Sacred Heart was my first day here. So, uh, the yeah, so it was my the first Sacred assignment. Heart 2019. Yep. 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 Well, so that's much very I didn't know back then. Yeah. Well, I was in, uh, I was in California for that. Yes. Yeah. I was, uh, going to a friend's wedding, which was on mm. the feast of the Sacred Heart. My friend, James Majewski, many of the listeners of the podcast will know because, uh, he is actually a member of the parish now because they just moved from Washington Heights. He and his wife oh, and child man, just nice. moved from Washington Heights to the Upper East Side. So, but he, uh, we co-host a, a podcast here at another podcast, a film discussion podcast. Oh, here I've Catholic seen, Culture. I've seen, I've seen a few of those. Yes, and he and he also hosts our Catholic Culture audiobooks mm-hmm. podcast, uh, where he reads the Church Fathers and other uh, Catholic classic works. He's an actor, um, so yeah, they're very interesting. Yeah, that was a big day. Yeah, uh, for for us as well. Um, so. Um, I guess I'll ask why bluegrass. <laughs> That's a great question. Um, to be fully honest, it was, I, it was never my decision. I just sort of wanted to drum, and that was what we were going to do. So I was like, okay, well, if I'm just going to drum with bluegrass with you. Uh, it's sort of a confluence of many different sort of streams in the Dominican life we had in Washington D.C. So like, there's the first move with. Father Thomas Joseph White, Father Austin Litke, when they were student brothers and then become young priests, they this was their a lot more at home for them, uh, their southern roots and uh, you know, the, mm. the playing the music together, um, and then the sort of second wave came in, playing more like Irish traditional music, playing just like David Bowie and pop songs, and just wanting to play more of that and just having an appreciation for the American folk tradition, more on the folk side than the bluegrass side. Um, But forever, I don't actually even know how those two streams came together, Uh, but they did. And we, I think we just found bluegrass sort of connected more. There's especially the chance to, there's a deep sort of like Christian tradition, uh, at least in some segments of bluegrass, you can sort of tell people you're, you're going to die, but you can be hopeful and, it's a lot better when you have a bluegrass song about it rather than just simply saying it bluntly. Uh, and so I think there's sort of like, it took off from there. Uh, but I, I would look mainly to Father Austin Litke, Father Thomas Joseph White as uh, the sort of steerers 
of towards the bluegrass and that the later musicians sort of uh, just entered into the flow of that. Lived through time, passed through fire, broke my heart, wounded desire, changed my life, fixed the past, I stared at death and it stared back. Standing fast in the light of the word, a shotgun blast was the last thing I heard. I rattled in the wind like a window pane, my soul's alright but my body complains. Death's in the world and it's gone viral Everybody's talking about a new revival When it's a question of love and survival Bourbon, bluegrass and the Bible Sleep like a giant, watch the rain Music at night, music in the day You live your life without getting paid You're a child of the storm, a child of the Lord You live your life without getting bored You lose your mind, but you find it again and Talking about grace and talking about sin This in the world and it's gone viral Everybody's talking about a new revival But when it's a question of love and survival and bluegrass and the Bible. Preacher, don't lie, there's whiskey in the still. A fox in the rain done had his fill. Chicken in the bread pan, picking out dough. And play that song wherever I go. People on the left. in the world and it's gone viral everybody's talking about a new revival but when it's a question of love and survival bourbon bluegrass and the bible of love and survival bourbon bluegrass and the bible death obviously that's a big 
topic yeah, yeah, in folk yeah. music in general, in the yeah. blues, in the American folk tradition. Um, there's another thing that I noticed in the lyrics, which I, I got the, all the songs seem to be written by either Father Thomas Joseph White or Father Justin Bulger. Yes, yes. Um, and uh, there's also a couple, two or three traditional songs on there as well. Um, what I noticed is a very, especially from Father Thomas Joseph White, a very apocalyptic <laughs> vibe specifically. Yeah. And yeah. it may be yeah, you know, the yeah. Flannery. He definitely has the most yeah. funk in his songs, the most yeah. Uh, yeah. Southern grotesque in his songs of, <laughs> of, of, of all of them. Yep. Um, and uh, do you, it, but the apocalyptic thing seemed appropriate, and I don't know that mm. much about bluegrass. But is there a, is there a precedent for that specifically, or is it, does it just really fit in with the focus on death and kind of the more yeah. existential aspects of folk music? Yeah, I'm I'm definitely no expert on on bluegrass and folk, uh, but I mean, especially even just from the first album, a lot of those covers we did, uh, just like poor wayfaring stranger or even like songs like All Fly Away, there is, I mean, if you are asking yourself, what are we literally, what do, or what, what's the literal meaning of these lyrics? Uh, I think just across the board, there's a lot of, at least especially in the Christian segment of these different types of music, uh, I think there's death and hope in all of, just across the board. Uh, and obviously there's other things like there's like romance songs there's like my wife cheated on me I'm going to kill her kind of songs and those are obviously kind of excluded <laughs> for kind of obvious reasons for a group of Dominican friars uh, so focus on the Christian songs I think in bluegrass country folk um, there's this tends to be just a natural um, I, I mean hope in heaven uh, and that means singing about death as part of that hope in heaven that uh, we will get to the other side, yeah. I also think it seems that the American Protestant tradition of a certain kind, mm -hmm. um, and especially in the South, has a lot more comfort with talking about the end times mm -hmm. and yeah, the, yeah, the second yeah, coming yeah. and all that kind of stuff. They, mm -hmm. they like to talk about that stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. So it fits, even in a, with a Catholic group, it kind yeah, of, yeah. I don't know, it fits well because, um, you know, as Catholics, those are things that we seemingly shy away from a little bit. Yeah, you know, we don't yeah. want to seem kooky, um, uh, and and unfortunately, I think that modern American Catholicism sometimes identifies itself. Something I've been thinking about a lot lately, actually, uh, uh, almost in opposition to. We don't want to be look like we're like those, you know, these evangelicals or whatever it is. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm, that's something mm -hmm. I've noticed as well. So I think it's good to be more yeah. comfortable talking about those things without, you know, going in for flashy colors and tickling people's ears and all yeah, that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I especially felt it this past November, both with the COVID-19, but also November every year, the readings are about death, apocalypse, heaven, hell, judgment. And I either have to like really work hard and avoid it or just own it and just like own the words of Jesus Christ, be his preacher uh, and, and to proclaim, it's right there in the Gospels for, um, and it even kind of goes into the first week, two weeks of Advent too. Uh, so, uh, I mean, it, in some ways it takes more work to try to avoid it uh, and, and just to take Jesus at his word. And especially November as Catholics, it's, it should be right there. So um, that being said, I also know when you're, you know, in your 30s, you can, Death seems like an abstract thing. And so having reverence mm -hmm. for it, for people who know that, it, uh, especially in a pandemic, it could be uh, months away. You, you just never know. So to not treat it flippantly, but to still uh, to, to preach hope into that, into that fear of death. Yeah. So. Uh, yes. I'm kind of interested in this. Uh, this whole idea of working a craft as a religious mm -hmm. brother or mm -hmm. priest, mm -hmm. you know, uh, in, in the church, we have these sculptures by, gosh, what was his first name? McGlynn, Father McGlynn. Oh, Thomas, Father Thomas um, McGlynn. Father Thomas McGlynn, yeah. Uh, the Fatima statue and other things. Mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. I think he, I want to say he did the baptismal font, if I'm he not did, mistaken. He did, he did. Yep. Um, yep. And, uh, that's always something that's been that's been intriguing to me um 
mm-hmm. this this combination. It seems in in a, in a way it seems to fit even better with a brother uh, mm-hmm. than with a priest. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But um, yeah, so h- how do you? You're obviously not like a sort of a full time Dominican musician or anything. No. But, but how <laughs> how do you see that um, yeah, personally yeah, yeah. and in in the your knowledge of the the wider tradition of people who devote themselves to a craft, let's say, other than teaching, because mm-hmm. obviously that's a very common thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but some kind of field, like with Father Nicanor, for example, as a scientist, um, how do you see that those things intersecting? Oh, excellent question. I think for as musicians, in some ways, it's more of a recreational. I mean, you could say hobby if you wanted, uh, but in the sense of like, this is something we do to, um, you know, recuperate our spirit, to to unwind. Uh, so like sometimes like after a long day, <laughs> it sounds weird, but I was like, take out the spoons and just like go at it and just, uh, you know, sort of end my day by laying out any frustrations I have <laughs> through percussion. Uh, and so in some ways it's more of like um, a recreational thing sort of added on. Uh, and then in the actual like, okay, let's produce something as brothers. Um, I think we understand this is marginal. It's not what, it's not like the heart of the Dominican vocation. I and mean, we don't want to like take our identity as like, I'm a drummer first. No, like I'm a priest first. Um, and so for us, it still has a sort of like, extra just something fun that we like to do uh that we know is not as important as absolving sins as uh celebrating the mass as preaching the gospel but we also see it as something that's in harmony with that especially with preaching that there's a a kind of way that you preach through this um sort of as like a it's like a very easy if you have like someone who uh, has walls up against the catholic faith whether a fallen away catholic or a protestant or an atheist giving the music is like a very like gentle first step so we sort of see it as a sense of preaching uh, but also knowing it's not like the heights of preaching either so to, to not take it too seriously just enjoy it um, it's also quite blunt uh, quite frankly it's a fundraiser too so it's a way um, fundraising is uh, sort of a modern term for being a mendicant and so it is yeah. a way of saying keeping close to that uh, we uh, we rely on the support of generous and faithful people. And so it is a bit of a fundraiser uh, to support, especially this ex- explicitly supports uh, the formation of our friars in Washington, D.C. So it's a little bit of that, that fundraiser, uh, just having fun together as brothers, trying to do something good, but uh, not allowing it to become our identity either. Proceeds from this album all go to the student brothers, right? To yeah. to the education, the formation of yeah. the brothers in uh, the Dominican of House of House of Studies in D.C. Correct? Yes, and actually, in addition to that, well, along with that, uh, one of the, we had a benefactor from Cincinnati, from our parish there, that covered all of the overhead. So basically. Um, all proceeds go right to D.C. So right, so it's the album's already paid for. Yep. Yep. The costs are already covered. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Um, so this is the second album. Uh, I haven't heard yeah. the first one. Uh, are there any kind of notable distinctions between the, the selections on those two albums? Yeah. So the first album is mainly covers just one, one original and one, um, one very original cover of uh, arrangement of, um, oh my gosh, the really famous, uh, Amazing Grace. Uh, Father, right. at the time, Brother Justin did this great arrangement, taking it from 3 4 into 4 4. Mm. Uh, but then the uh, I'm a Dog original uh, was on right. that first album. I think I have heard that one, yeah. Yeah, yeah. What, what, he, he, writes, uh, he writes tracks with really fun titles because once you hear I'm a Dog, you're not going to forget that. You're like, what? Right. You to, you know, and this album has Give Me a Drink, which we thought about making that the album cover, uh, album title, just to see. Uh, especially, uh, you know, Baptists, how they would react to Catholic priests saying that. Uh, but we figured that we figured against that. Um, <laughs> but so this album has a lot more originals, as you mentioned, Father Justin, Father Thomas Joseph being the main writers. Uh, I think Father Jonah Teller also wrote, a, uh, wrote some, uh, wrote one. He uh, co-wrote one with, yeah. He, yeah, yeah. 
with Justin. And then um, we don't have a fiddle on this one. That You'll notice that we're hoping to get the fiddle back for the third album. I see. Uh, so that will, hopefully you don't hear it missing, but we felt it the whole album. Well, I don't like, because I didn't hear the first album. <laughs> good, good. Well, yeah, the third album is going to be even greater. So, uh, okay. And, cool. and I think well, the other things... Um, and it's tough to hear it originally, to hear it with fresh ears. But with the first album, we recorded it in, in, in bits and pieces. So we just recorded every Saturday for about like two months. So we were just going to classes as usual. And then Saturday morning, we would take over a room and set up all the microphones, record, and then tear down the microphones and then go back. And then, uh, which is a lot of work for like a, a little bit of recording. Whereas with this album, we just took over one of our, our places here in New York and we just owned one of the rooms for two weeks. And so we mm. set up once and then just recorded and then tore down. That's great. Uh, yeah. And we had a lot more time to jam together, to play together, to try out things together. So the, there's a, I hope it comes through. There's a little bit more of a cohesion in this album of the mm. uh, players listening to each other, playing together, sort of melding our sound together. Uh, so it's a little bit more of a authentic sort of brotherhood in, in the music. I hope, I hope you can hear that, yeah. Nightfall, this way comes I am tired and far from home And I don't know how this goes I only know how it seems Seems like a perfect night If only I had a light within and without All around Master, I want to see So won't you lead me by the hand When I'm blind and I can't find A place to stand All is sand All I'm doing is sinking more Waiting for you to lead me by the hand Someone this way come They say he's the one who will lead me home And I don't know where I'm going I only know where I've been I've been everywhere Keep on going over the same Ready for you to leave So won't you lead me by the hand When I'm blind and I can't find A place to stand All is sand All I'm doing is sinking more Waiting for you to lead me by the hand When that morning star rises in my heart of darkness, I'll know you're not far away. Hey.
So you had played, I know you played at the Appaloosa Festival, right? In, yeah, uh, in yeah. In Virginia. I know a bunch of people involved with that. Kenny Cole Haas, yeah, Marie Miller, yeah. people like That's that. That's a great festival. Um, yeah. uh, so before, you know, lockdown and everything, how often did you guys get to play together? Oh, that's a great question. Um, Either publicly so, or privately. No, yeah. So when we were we, when we were all together in D.C., that was probably, uh, I would say, like five things a year where we really played together, like different in-house, like ordination receptions, and then mm. maybe like one or two like concerts or gigs, um, and then maybe a couple of jams here and there. But it has definitely spread out. And since most of us now are priests, we get together as a whole group, maybe once a year for recording. And then whoever's near each other can get together. There's a couple of the friars are at Providence College, so they can, Father Justin, Father Peter Joseph can play together more often. Um, so it is now like a new phase where we're priests being sent out uh, and then only coming together uh, rarely now, yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Um I have to ask, too, about the background of Dominicans playing bluegrass, because the album cover of the first album is, of course, you know, this this yeah. great picture. Uh, yeah. There's some wonderful photos in this album as well. Uh, but the, the first album has this great picture of these Dominicans yeah. with, you yeah. know, banjos yeah. and whatnot. So yeah. what's what's the background there? Where does that come from? That is a great question. I just bluntly don't know. Uh, we found that picture. Actually, I was doing... We have all these things on a Google share Google Drive. So I, was, I was typed in JPEG just to like see what I could get. I was trying to get together a uh, a collection of Christmas carol lyrics, and I wanted a picture to put on the cover of that. And I found that picture. And I was like, oh yeah, you can just like stare wow. at these faces forever because of the haircuts, the instruments, the expressions. Uh, yeah. So evidently they were playing music. We don't know. I mean, I think other friars might know the the backstory more. I know like. There, I have heard that uh, in medieval times, friars would do things in public squares like juggling and music and something like that to right. get people Sounds engaged. Sounds more Franciscan, but, though. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. Um, but I don't know in recent... I know like out wet, like there's been other attempts at playing music together as friars, but, um, but nothing like within the Washington DC, within the Eastern province, I don't know of any actual history besides uh, like student brothers just sort of being told, um, you know, do something fun that stays inside. So, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, so you've got some great pictures in this new album too, the cover image, uh, a Dominican mm -hmm, friar mm -hmm. clearly standing on some, you know, raised platform, clearly yeah, preaching yeah. Or, or something, but in an outdoor forum that looks, you know, of a piece with the kind of Southern revival yeah, kind yeah, of tent yeah. preaching kind of thing, but in a Catholic context. So um, that I'm, I'm assuming this is some kind of mission, uh, maybe. Uh, and and I, I know vaguely that this was a thing maybe done more commonly in the past, but that's another fascinating aspect of the Dominican history and charism to me is these, tra these traveling missions. Can you tell me anything mm. about that? Yeah, so that was a big part of the Dominican life was um, parish missions, just mission preaching. It still happens, at least up to COVID, uh, parish missions, but in a lot lower of a way. We had a whole preaching band uh, that would, in the band and in the other sense of the word band, that would go out and 
go in, you know, twos, threes, fours, fives, and just go through. And plus, at the time, our province went all the way down to Florida and over, um, maybe not all the way to the Mississippi, but close to, you know, went, went west from there. Uh, and just traveling and preaching. Uh, and that was their full assignment. So it was a whole life on the road, a whole way of proclaiming. Uh, and going into a, a South, right, that was primarily Protestant and trying to reach out, trying to, there's a picture of the, um, like the chapel on wheels, like they have like a big trailer on the back of a truck that has an actual chapel, you can say mass. Uh, and, and that's like, you know, um, back, where was that picture from? It looks like the 1930s, 1920s, 40s. Um, and so, yeah, just this mission preaching. That's where actually where we got a lot of vocations from, too, uh, mm-hmm. were people who saw these missionary Dominicans. And, and notice, because I think there was a big culture of preaching back then. That was kind of like the entertainment in the town. Was a, there was a preacher yeah. coming to town. And, uh, and then when the, within Catholic world, within the Catholic culture, there was different sense of how Dominicans preached, how Redemptorists preached, how the other. Uh, and so Dominicans sort of, people got a sense of their charism from, the style of preaching, uh, especially the emphasis on grace, the emphasis on Jesus Christ himself. Um, and, and that's where we got a lot of vocations from. So what's your own musical background? Yeah, so I, so it's, there's sort of two tracks for me. On one side, drumming. So high school drum line, college drum line, doing percussion ensembles, orchestra, concert band, just so everything from drumline to like timpani to marimbas. Uh, and the other track would be composition and theory. That was my major in college. Uh, I mean, I was nothing ever great, but I just really loved it. Uh, and so especially like learning the polyphony of Palestrina, the tonal forms of Beethoven, and, and then just like the raw energy of Stravinsky and, you know, uh, just both bitonal and um, polyrhythmic. Uh, and so there's having, those are like the, like, there's a little bit of a strange combination, percussion, and then, you know, Palestrina, Beethoven, Stravinsky, even those three composers are a little bit of a strange combination, but there's, I think this is really good mu- music. Sure. Uh, and so those loves just sort of, I carry with me. Um, and, and then plus two with, with drumming, there's also like the jazz drumming. I think I was raised, yeah. I, when I was in eighth grade, my dad was like, okay, if you're, if you're going to want to be a drummer, here's Art Blakey. Here's Gene Krupa. Here's Buddy Rich. This is what you gotta be listening to. Mm. Uh, so I still have those albums today. And just, you know, oh, that's, that's great. That's that sort great. of shapes me. Now, of course, that means that when I come to Bluegrass, I I want to start like, what would Gene Krupa be doing here? And everyone's like, you gotta tone that. You gotta tone that down. It's like, but you come on, like, let's do some polyrhythms. It's like, no, no, give me a basic backbeat. It's like, okay, I'll give you a basic backbeat, right. and then I'll work in some. I'll work in some jazz rhythms. <laughs> <laughs> That's a constant sort That's of holding funny. back. <laughs> That's really funny. Well, you probably yeah. like Bella Fleck then. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, he's great. He's great. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's cool. I'm glad you mentioned Art Blakey first. That's uh, yeah, yeah. That's very good. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm a jazz guy. So I'm jazz trained as a jazz pianist. That's my mm. that's my college degree. So uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So um, what, who were some of your favorite drummers then, other than those guys? Um. So I basically, I idolized those three jazz drummers uh, and then, and then just like marching band drumming. I just like would watch these videos of march. So like, uh, so a combination of both like the sort of wild improvisations of jazz drummers, but then also like the thunder of a drum line, like a, like a DCI mm-hmm. core, uh, just, just like sort of shakes the soul. And like, and I like that feeling. Um, and then the other fun thing about being a drummer too is just like picking up a uh, new style. So like uh, I spent a year in Ireland and so learning the Balron or Bo, there's so many different ways to pronounce that yeah, yeah. Irish drum and just like learning that. And then just like picking up uh, more and more, like learning how to play the spoons, learning how to play the washboard. Um, and so, yeah. So, so like with jazz drumming, like, so basically I'm just like a, an amateur and all these things. So like, so I know those three drummers and then I just started getting other genres in, in sort of like my drumming repertoire. Yeah. 
Well, that's very interesting. So, what about these other uh, these other guys? I mean, uh, like Father Thomas Joseph White, Father Justin, yeah, uh, yeah, Father yeah. Austin. What's their background as musicians? No, those are great questions. Uh, so, Father Thomas Joseph, and I only know partially. So, I, I know Father Thomas Joseph White. I think in high school he had a band. He was sharing some of that. So, I think he has a sense uh, both of music, but also performance and you know song writing. Uh, Father Justin Bolger was in a very real way a professional musician with his sister Judd and Maggie. Uh, they did some Catholic Underground. They recorded. Oh Nashville. yeah, I know yeah. who they. I think those were friends of my sister. Actually, was okay, with excellent. Them. I, yeah. I vaguely, I feel like I probably met them when I was like in my early teens or like yeah, twelve yeah. or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah so Father I Justin, about them. Wow. yeah, no, he he's like the ringer we have. Uh, so he both has like great music skills. He's a good uh, songwriter, yeah. And a great songwriter, and also knows how to record, so like engineering skills and such, uh, which is a great help. Um, Father Austin Litke, I don't know his background that well. I mean, he, he's from Kentucky, and he plays the mandolin really well, along with the guitar. I think, I mean, yeah, I don't know the whole story, but he's an excellent musician. Uh, Father Peter Joseph uh, also went to Notre Dame with me. He, I think, really studied piano, both classical and jazz, but then also just from his family, just great bass, great six string guitar, great mandolin. Uh, and just, a, I don't know if he has perfect pitch, but it's pretty, pretty close, whatever he has, because mm. he's the one who says like, uh, you know, he, he's the one who helps us tune uh, beyond yeah. just what tuners can tell you. Um, uh, and then father, both father Jonah and right now, Brother Simon, uh, both from the same family, the Teller family. And they were all just raised playing music together as a family. Nice. Uh, and uh, Brother Simon was in the Stillwater Hobos down at University of Dallas. Hmm. Uh, so he has some recording experience and did a lot of uh, music on the streets in Asheville, North Carolina. Um, and then that leaves Father Timothy Danaher. Who just has like he's he's from Steubenville and he just says tells you that that's the home of the um, oh who was the great uh, dean right um, uh, James Dean right no, no wait so who's the crooner um, Dean Martin Dean Martin sorry mix my names up right? so he he just has that like yeah. crooner in him so he can he just has a voice yeah. that when when he gets the whole the melody it's just like he gets the whole nice. bat on it and just takes it out of the park. <laughs> Assistance, Lord, come to my help. The waters have reached high, they're up to my neck. They're up to my neck. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Every hour, every day, our help is in the name of the Lord. Tears from looking for you. My foes compass me about. They blaze like a fire. They blaze like a fire. Our help is in the name.
distance Lord, come to my help Oh God, come to my assistance Lord, come to my help Lord, come to my help Our help is in the name In the name of the Lord, our help is in the name of the Lord. Our help is in the name of the Lord. So, uh, you know, being Dominican priests and having a kind of a, a life of prayer. Uh, yeah. built in to to your daily life how did th how did that apply to the recording process I mean when I I recorded on somebody's album last year and it was a very uh, very holy man's album that I was playing on and so you know we went to mass we went to adoration we said the rosary on the long drive to the studio did you guys do, do anything like that uh, on the days that you were recording yeah a great question so basically we just lived the usual Dominican schedule that we were raised in as novices. So starting off the day with meditation and then off the readings, morning prayer, mass, uh, and then getting, you know, daytime prayer in the middle and then eve rosary and evening prayer, sometimes with a holy hour in the evening uh, and then uh, compliment at night, right? But then basically in between all of those, that's usual rhythm that's just like sort of in our bones as Dominicans from formation, we just music <laughs> which is like basically food and music so you'd eat record and someone would be cleaning the dishes someone was recording uh and and so in some ways it felt very natural to us just this usual rhythm uh mm. and and bringing uh a sort of like just knowing that you like you do work in in bits and pieces that way you can go back to prayer uh bring your work to god and then come back from prayer re renewed ready to record again uh, and it's also a way of keeping our priorities in line that we definitely want to record a great album, but when it's Vespers time, Vespers is more important than this project. Like praising God is, uh, mm. is, you know, at the heart of just being a baptized Catholic, uh, especially as a Dominican. And so, um, yeah, it was, it, it felt basically the sort of like, I mean, obviously, this is more of a Benedictine word, like the ora et labora. And usually for Dominicans, that labora is study and preaching. But for mm -hmm. those two weeks, it was music, jamming and recording, you know. Uh, so it was a beautiful way of bringing together the Dominican life uh, while also recording and um, allowing Jesus Christ to, to, to really reign. And especially like having sure. holy hours, we're just like, you know, essentially wasting time but in the best sense of that uh, sense of just being with him and knowing that uh adoring him is more important than recording and he'll make it work when we get back to the microphones sure. yeah well beauty comes from the holy spirit so amen. you know amen good idea to stay in touch yeah <laughs> also uh you know also you know <laughs> just having things broken up is actually good because mm -hmm. focus is good but Spending seven or eight hours straight in the studio really puts a glaze over your eyes. Yeah, you know? yeah. It was, uh, there's a special, so, oh, here's, so, <laughs> this is actually kind of funny. So most of the musicians are in the, like, the main room we're recording in, but as a drummer, just by nature of my instruments, I'm always going to be too loud and mm -hmm. can bleed over into their microphones, which is not good. So I was sort of in this side room that was like right off the main room, and right in front of me, was just like a paper print of Fra Angelico's Last Judgment. Uh, hmm. And so like in, like you just have like the heavenly court with angels bringing down the cross. And then on one side of the cross are people who are running away from the cross and going into fire and torture. On the other side are people who are walking in to greet angels and there's hugs and there's dancing and they're like these angels leading people onto this like stairway of light uh, into the heavenly realms. And we're playing this music. And as you said, there's a lot of apocalyptic uh, images in it. And when we're, we're recording, you're, sometimes you're playing the same song, you know, like anywhere from 10 to 25 times. And as you said, it's like you just sort of like have to stay locked in and just keep playing it, and especially as a drummer. 
and you're not supposed to play too many fun notes. You're just like, boom, cha, boom, cha, boom, cha, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm just like staring at the apocalypse, both like the beauty of like the friendship of the saints and the angels and like really tender scenes, right? Frangelico paints heaven in such a convincing way. And then also looking at the other side and seeing like, oh man, you know? And so just having this like really like sort of like spiritual experience of just like, okay, let's record another time, like number 15. And just like looking at that and playing, locking in on the rhythm and, you know, playing, playing well, mm -hmm. but also like meditating in this, in this sort of strange setting. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> So when you talked about jamming, you, you were—I guess—you were coming up with a lot of the arrangements just in like sort of prior to recording in the yeah. studio there. Yeah. So basically, oftentimes it was at night or the first thing in the morning. We would say, "Okay, today we're going to try to do this song. Let's just start playing a couple of times without microphones yet, and just sort of see what we're getting." Uh, and sort of have, I think a lot of the songs we sort of knew at the beginning what kind of sound we wanted, but some of the songs took radical different uh, probably the biggest one <laughs> was chasing money no more that song i think was supposed to be a little more country we, we there was a point where it was starting to sound like the beatles and so we were told mm. okay you can't put any hand claps in this song <laughs> so mm. you'll hear a cowbell instead it's, it's just a little bit in the <laughs> in the chorus yeah and this is like um it's the one song with an electric bass all the other songs have a, an upright mm. Uh, you know, a uh, regular double bass, but like, so having an electric bass and this is like sort of pounding four on the floor, just like, just like downbeats, just like being hit really hard. Uh, and uh, I think Father Thomas Joseph White was sort of seeing his baby being taken away from him and raised in a very different culture than what he expected. I hope he still likes it. Um, but it was one of those songs that just as we jammed with it, it new doors were opened. I thought I found the holy grail But its touch was as cold as hell I lived inside the walls of Babylon Just before they fell Everything eventually turns to dust All the possessions eventually rust The things of the spirit are the only thing to trust well, you try to find what life is for But it's hard to even find the door You wonder where you came from And what you should live for Everybody's interested in paradise Till they find out it doesn't always feel nice And I ain't gonna spend my time chasing money no more I read a book of Renaissance history It was a true story of I bought it from the man in the black hat at the yard sale He said, son, the heroes all gave in And there's no point in naming sins Then he gave me a stack of cash at the back of the station inn Oh, they say it takes all the pain away From the dawn of time until the break of day But it's funny how it never really works out that way Everybody's interested in paradise Till they find out it doesn't always feel nice And I ain't gonna spend my time chasing money no more Take 
takes to live And there's a world of people who know what it means to really give But these refined considerations aside If you want to learn to be truly alive Drink the blood and let's start living for the other side Well, you try to find what life is for But it's hard to even find the door You wonder where you came from and what you should live for Everybody's interested in paradise Till they find out it doesn't always feel nice And I ain't gonna spend my time chasing money no more And I ain't gonna spend my time chasing money no more That was the best piano solo so far. That was bad. One of the other interesting things too was sometimes the singer would change. So some of these songs were written by Father Thomas Joseph White, but sung by Father Jonah, or sometimes Father Justin's songs were sung Did by Father Did he sing Timothy. that one? Father, uh, Father Thomas sing, Joseph sang Chasing, Chasing Money. Money. Father Jonah was singing uh, Heaven or Tennessee. Um, gotcha, yeah. Yeah. Well, there's so, one verse yeah. on Chasing Money No More that is in particularly rock and roll-esque in, like, the phrasing. <laughs> and you, you probably know the one I'm talking about. It's the one where he's, like, double-timing it. You know, yeah, you know yeah, what I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah. Uh, the uh, the Ancients, They've Gone and Died, that one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's the one where I he think, just, too, like, to have it in your rapidly. mind, uh, I think a lot of these songs Father Thomas Joseph White wrote in Rome as he's, you know, sort of in the midst of... Um, of you know all of the the church hierarchy and then just all the Italians in Rome, and and mm. he just wants like, so the, the song Heaven or Tennessee, you sort of fear this like right. I want to be back with Americans, <laughs> I want right. And he, again. he he <laughs> talks about in uh, Chasing Money No More, he specifically refers to reading books of Renaissance history, you know, being. <laughs> Like a, a chronicle of vanity, and you know the ancients didn't care about policy; they were yeah, about. Yeah. There's a couple of references to that in different lyrics on the song. Is like yeah, people are yeah. talking about policy instead of like the simple. Oh yeah, there's uh, uh, the life of Jesus. Yeah, you will still walk down the line. It says Saint Paul didn't talk about policy; he talked about the life of faith. Uh, right. Just this, like, yeah. So yeah, there's a little bit. Yeah, you know, good. he's yeah. It's helpful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we've got a lot of programs and policies in the you know the church. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But it comes down to um, faith in Jesus Christ. Yeah. 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 And love. So, uh, can I ask you about your own uh, your own vocation story since I oh, have you here? Yeah, I'll be happy to. Um, yeah, the 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 easiest way to I don't really have like a single moment, but what I would mm -hmm. say is that my vocation story is as if God were it was like a jigsaw puzzle that was flipped upside down. So just seeing the cardboard side of the pieces and just seeing them fit together. It's like, oh, I like that. I like that. Like, you know, I like the rosary. I like the idea of preaching. Uh, I like the idea of living as brothers. I like the idea of evangelical poverty. And just putting all these pieces together and then seeing that sort of puzzle be flipped over and be like, oh, as Dominicans. Uh, this fit me in a funny way. I was in Delaware of all places and I was just there for like, uh, I was there for two years, but in the first month we were trying to like make friends. Uh, I was at like a theology on tap and uh, some, something like, like a young adult sort of like church mass and dinner afterwards. And at the dinner, I'm just making small talk and I'm talking with a young man who had been uh, a novice with the central province. Uh, who, and who loved Dominicans just realized it wasn't for him. And so just out of politeness, I was like, oh, tell me about Dominicans. And he was explaining to them about how, like, you know, preaching and prayer and brotherhood and, uh, and the poverty and uh, study. And I was just like, isn't that what everyone wants to do with their life? Like, what's so unique about that? And then, then I realized, oh, that not everyone wants to do that. Like, <laughs> that's just like, it's just like what I've always wanted uh, in a certain uh, sense. Wow. Uh, and so, yeah, just like, like things like the rosary were just like the first, like that's how I was, I learned how to pray was praying the rosary and sort of mm. had an experience of Mary teach me how to pray. Uh, and then when I read the biography of St. Dominic, I think the first one was Guy Bidwell, Grace of the Word. Uh, 
uh, which he says is not a life of Dominic, but it's basically biographical uh, with, with, with commentary on it. Uh, and I just read it, I was like, I just felt connected. I was like, oh yeah, I get Dominic. Or maybe like he gets me, I don't know, something's happening here. Uh, I feel like I have a friend, but he died in 1221. Um, and, uh, and, and basically the people I was living with realized like I had a crush <laughs> on Dominicans and just sort of like fell kind of head over heels for that. Uh, and, and I really, and I, I don't mean this as an exaggeration. I, just, I really just haven't ever stopped. Like, I mean, obviously there were days where I was going crazy in formation, mainly for my own imperfections and selfishness. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, just the, there's a special joy of St. Dominic. Um, d- you know, in his preaching, in in the sort of like, I want to set Christendom on fire. I want to preach to all, um, and uh, and that just that just caught me, and and also the witness too of the friars I met at the first couple of friars I met, Father Ambrose Eckinger, Father Ignatius Schweitzer, uh, although he was brother at the time, and then also too the witness of. Uh, different Dominican sisters, the Ann Arbor sisters, the Nashville sisters, who were the first ones I came across, and just uh, just being really impressed with it, and uh, just kept following it, and uh, haven't looked back. So I, I think if I had to blame someone, it would be Mary and the Rosary. Uh, mm. But yeah, but there's a lot more strands going on. But that, I think that the Rosary, in particular way, would be a sort of I mean, as a thread uh, going through the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think we need more preaching of the rosary. I, Saint F- Father John Maria talked about that when he was mm. on here. He was said he was really hoping that there would be a revival of preaching of the rosary, in particular, mm. by the Dominicans, because, you know, that's that's who's got to how to got to do it. You know, well, especially uh, as a revival of, of faith. Um, one of the things uh, I've studied a little bit of John Paul II's Mariology. And, and he really holds her up as like the, the mother of faith, both that she is a model of faith, but right, when the disciples first believe, it's at Cana, and mm-hmm. Mary is, has that initiating role, and then Jesus says, hold on, Mom, I'm going to initiate. This is my miracle. Let me take over, right? Uh, that's how John Paul II interprets that exchange between mm-hmm. uh, Jesus and her mother, Jesus and his mother. Um, and so like Mary, like she has a line, uh, John Paul II has this line that, Mary's faith kindles the faith of the apostles, mm. of the disciples. Uh, and we need faith. That's, we always need faith. Uh, but especially, like Vatican II, as John Paul put it, was this call for renewal in the faith. Uh, and that call for renewal still needs to be fulfilled. Uh, I think uh, we're seeing that more and more. Uh, and, and so the rosary in particular way is a, a real powerful, a really powerful uh, approach to faith to to look upon the central mysteries of Jesus Christ with the help of Mary as his mother and our mother that we would believe in him believe in the incarnation believe in the resurrection um, yeah 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 well I would say to any preacher don't don't be afraid to be a, a broken record <laughs> uh, about the rosary you know? yeah 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 <laughs> Well, thank you for telling me uh, your vocation story. That's yeah. that's beautiful. That's great. Oh, you, you just you just like that was very natural to you. It always yeah. was something that you wanted, basically. Yeah. Yeah. That's very cool. Keep those lamps trimmed now. Keep those lamps trimmed. Midnight's coming in, would you keep those lambs trimmed? You do not know the day and you do not know the hour. Keep watch, stay awake, you do not know the day. Mercy. 
Keep those lamps trim now. Keep those lamps trim. Midnight's coming in. Would you keep those lamps trim? Got no time to waste now, got no time to waste Bridegroom's coming soon and got no time to waste mm -hmm. From the depths I cry Keep those lamps trimmed now. Keep those lamps trimmed now. Keep those lamps trimmed now. Would you keep those lamps trimmed? Keep those lamps trimmed now. Would you keep those lamps trimmed now? Keep those lamps trimmed now. Would you keep those lamps trimmed? Keep those lamps trimmed now. Would you keep those lamps trimmed now? Keep those lamps trimmed now. Would you keep those lamps trimmed? Keep those lamps trimming now. Keep those lamps trimmed now. Keep those lamps trimming now. Would you keep those lamps trimmed? Well, Father Joseph, thank you so much for uh, coming on the show and talking course, to me. Of course, of course, it was a great joy. It was. It, we've been seeing each other for so long. It's nice to have a good time, have a good chat together. <laughs> absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Um, so again, people, the album is uh, "Living for the Other Side." I'll link to this in the show notes. Um, but uh, I guess you can go. Uh, is Dominicana the the Dominicana website the best place to go? Well, now there's a new website and it's simply hillbillytomists.com. So it's in the plural, hillbillytomists.com and that will have uh, on the on January 28th for the feast day, it will have the new album to to buy. It also will have a, a new video will come out that day and oh, there's other little links there too. So check it out. You know what? I have to ask you. I forgot to ask about the name of the band. I know, oh, but not yeah. everybody knows. So you got to explain that. Yeah. So it comes from Flannery O'Connor, the great Catholic novelist from the South. Uh, and after, I think after her novel, Wise Blood, she was sort of accused in a playful sense of that word, I think, of being a hillbilly nihilist. Um, and, and she re, you know, uh, responded that she was a hillbilly Thomist. So this sense of... Um, a real deep um, confidence in the working of grace, even when you see all the brokenness of humanity, that grace is efficacious and mm. grace will get the job done. Uh, and so that our, our hope is not in our works. Our hope is in the work of God and grace. We obviously, we cooperate with it, uh, but grace itself is efficacious. Right. Um, so yeah, so it's this uh, Flannery O'Connor retort that uh, is a, as playful and kind of marks the band for being this, um, you know, as you said earlier, that sort of Southern grotesque sort of approach to things sometimes. Right. Um, so yeah, hillbillytomists.com. That's the place for people to go. I'll link yeah. to it. And uh, thank you for talking to me. Thank you for letting me play some of the songs in here. Yeah. yeah. And um, I will just say to people, uh, if you are watching this on YouTube, please subscribe. We we are new on YouTube, trying to build the channel. Um, please also consider uh, donating to Catholic Culture if you want to see these uh, podcasts keep going. We're entirely supported by listener donations, the whole podcast network, and uh, uh, you got to pay my salary somehow. So please uh, chuck us a dime or two at uh, catholicculture.org slash donate slash audio. Thanks again, Father Joseph. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for having me.